Father, as we continue your presence, we recognize that you spoke to the prophet Isaiah, I'm going to do a new thing in your days, and you would not believe it if I told you. And when I speak, your ears will tingle. As you mentioned that prophetic word Paul spoke in Acts 13 at Antioch. As your word says, Behold, you scoffers, Paul spoke to the unbelievers there in Acts 13, 40. Take heed, therefore, so that the things spoken of you and the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel, and perish. For I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. Father, we choose not to be in that category. We choose to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches in Jesus' name. As we think about ways in which we are going to be relating to the Lord as we move forward, and that is personally in our devotional life, and to orient to the God that we're going to be meeting on the historical scene, you'll meet him in the prophets. Peter talks about we were to remember the prophets, what was spoken through the prophets, 2 Peter 3, 2 and the singular commandment spoken to the apostles through our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look at the prophets, that we can learn about what we're going to be seeing when it relates to the church. Because remember, the prophets were always speaking to God's covenant people. It's not, well, the prophets are going to go see, I say always speaking God's covenant people. He does speak through Jeremiah to the nations, but predominantly the first point of reference is God's covenant people before he moves out to the contiguous nations and all the way out to the daughter of Babylon. We say, Lord, we want to meet you. We want to learn more about your personality, your character, and your unchangeableness as you are dealing with issues in your covenant people. That would be the church. You always begin with your people before you touch the nations. I wanted to revisit Ephesians. You remember in the outline of Ephesians, we have the first three chapters, which is, in terms of grammatical structure, it's referred to as doctrinal indicative. That simply means that the aorists and the tenses used in the first three chapters present reality. Indicative mood means it's the mood of reality. When we read all those wonderful statements about redemption and who Christ is and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working in conjunction with one another, like even Ephesians 1 to 14, we see that wonderful interaction there. We see the statements of fact. In other words, these facts are anchored in who we are as God's chosen people in Christ before the foundation of the world. You read John 17. And Jesus says, Father, I'm coming to you, and I'm praying that you keep them. And I've kept them in your name, you keep them. He says, for thine, your people, they ever were yours. Imperfect tense. Thine they ever were, you've given them to me, and they are mine. All things that are yours are mine, and all things that are mine are yours. So we see the co-equality and the co-essential relationship between the Father and the Son there in John 17. But he says, thine they were, and you have given them to me as a permanent gift. We're the gift. We are the gift of God the Father to Jesus Christ. And in the purpose of God, he's known about us from all eternity. He says, keep them in your name, Lord, that name which you've given me. As you meditate on scripture and you think about things like that, as I've been rereading the Gospel of John and Weist, I'm looking for things that I hadn't thought of before or not thought of, I should put it this way, I'm really looking for that which I've never heard or seen before. Because when you go to the Word, there's always new and fresh enlargement and dilation of the Word that we already know. And what is very striking when you read John, you look at the beginning of the miracle of the wedding at Cana, we see the changing of water in the wine. It's like the new birth, the new vessel. God's life comes in, and there's new wine in the vessel. And these are the clay pots. Then you move through the various sign miracles that are in the Gospel of John. The seventh and final sign miracle is in John 11, with Jesus delaying, and Mary and Martha, their brother has died, Lazarus, and they're very distressed. If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, well, did you not know that your brother will rise again? Yeah, I know in the resurrection he'll rise again. Well, I want you to know right now I am the resurrection and the life. And I not say to you that what has happened to your brother is for the glory of God. So they were very grieved at the loss. It's amazing, when you read chapter 11 and 12 together, it was at that point when Jesus raised Lazarus 
that it confirmed the Sanhedrin's judgment to kill Jesus. They're always looking for ways to entrap him, to arrest him, but when it came to a unified decision from the Sanhedrin, it was the raising of Lazarus. And that's the seventh miracle, something about the resurrection of Lazarus that sealed the hardness of those Pharisees. And what you see in chapter 12, they conspired to kill Lazarus. They're going to kill the evidence. So they're so hardened, and it was gradually, gradually, sequentially, it became hardened and hardened and hardened. So when you look at the history of Jesus in his walk throughout the church, you have an evolution and a final culmination of that which will be the manifestation of Jesus Christ and resurrection power, which will solidify and bring to completion the hardness of the Gentiles. Then when they are hardened and no longer open, then when the rapture occurs, then 100%, 100% of all Gentiles who are alive on earth at the rapture will be deceived and go to the lake of fire for their unbelief. Second Thessalonians. Something happened to harden their hearts. So what rise of the morning star and the manifestation of the morning star is part of that final closing act in context. Then these godless people, they've heard the gospel, they've denied the truth, they're going to be hardened. We see with the plot not only to kill Jesus, but the plot to kill Lazarus, that is the enemy is most jealous and most zealous to eliminate anything that represents the resurrection, life, and power of Jesus Christ. I've travailed for the Lord for many years. Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I really want to be filled. And of course, we know from Ephesians 5, keep on receiving fullness by means of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's a walk. And as I read through John, and the Lord began to say, you want to know why you haven't experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit yet? Are you ready for the kind of persecution Jesus experienced? He was a Spirit-filled man. He had the Spirit without measure, John 3.34. He had it without measure. He was walking in the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit. But what did it do? It incited the enemies and strengthened them in their resistance. While the common people, loving him, the tax gatherers and the sinners, the common folk, it was the religious establishment that was focused on taking him out. What we're going to see in the future is that that which is established Christianity, whatever form that may take, there's going to be first persecution that will come from that, and then it will come from the pagans. That's the order we see in the book of Acts. The history of Jesus in his church, Jesus has not yet been able on a corporate level to come to full formation and full stature in us, the church, but the last generation, there will be the consummation of the formation of Christ and the fullness of God being in the body of Christ as a testimony. That will be the morning star. So anyway, we have in Ephesians, we have the doctrinal indicative. I mean, Christ is head over all rule, authority, and principality and power. is the head over all things of the church. He's raised from the dead. The power that raised him from the dead is now available to believers. That We are now one with him and is being made alive and raised together and seated together with him in heavenly places. So we see the tremendous revelation of what it means to be the object of God's eternal purpose that in this hiatus between the fulfillment of the prophecies around the first coming of Christ and the second coming and in the nations, we have this prophetic parenthesis where the church is being called out from among the Gentiles for the Lord to make a name for himself in Acts 15. Mm -hmm. What we see is this tremendous eternal purpose intercalated. It's inserted in this prophetic parenthesis and it's like the whole prophetic clock is put on pause until this mystery of Christ and mystery of the head and body as one Christ comes to fullness and is completed in rapture and then the prophetic bookends will begin to come back together and we'll have Daniel's 70th week fulfilled leading up to the second coming of Jesus. It's huge and you know as I mentioned reading the book that I read that none of this is in the Old Testament. The gospel that Paul preached, the gospel of Christ in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, the scholars have said this can't be Paul because it's so unique it had to be somebody else. It doesn't even fit in any kind of a gospel paradigm. So who is this author, you know? Well, it was Paul. He was in prison. He was enlarged. And he had tremendous increase of spiritual capacity during that imprisonment in order to receive this massive download. We see this doctrinal indicative, the fact of who we are in Christ, his eternal purpose, and all that calling that it involves and identifies who we are in oneness with Christ and who he is his head. And then in chapter 4, verses 1 through chapter 6, verse 9, we have the walk. 
And we have all the details of what it means to walk out and give that identity that is ours in the first three chapters, that identity to come into living expression through walking worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Chapter 4, verse 1. Worthy of the calling. And it touches everything. It touches body life. It touches marriage life. It touches business. It touches everything that we call common. The mundane. It incorporates everything. And learning Christ and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we see in Ephesians 4. So that as Jesus Christ is being formed and able to walk out his life in our faith and obedience, individually and corporately, then that which is in Ephesians 1-3 through is formed in terms of all of its fullness, in terms of the walk, that which represents our way of life in faith and obedience in him. So that's chapter 4, 1 through chapter 6 and verse 9. Then after verse 9, okay, we have the walk. Once that walk is completed, once the walk of Jesus and our walk with Jesus as the church reaches its consummation on this earth, there is a final phase corporately. That final phase is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul did not know that this would be telescoped to a final generation. He had no way of knowing. But he says, finally, that is gathering up all that's preceded, our position, doctrinal indicative, the moral imperative, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, verse 9. As that synchronizes and comes to fullness, there's going to be a final shakedown. There's going to be denouement. There's going to be a closing act. And so Paul has the closing eschatological act in view here. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And you've heard me say this before. I remember visiting with Miles Stanford one time. I said, Miles, you know what it actually says in the Greek? It says, habitually allow yourself to be strengthened and empowered from within. Receiving the strength of God from within in union with the Lord and the strength of his might. He said, what translation are you reading from? I said, I'm just telling you what it is in the Greek. And so he asked me to write it out for him. Mm-hmm. So I'll never forget that. But that's what it says. It doesn't say be strong in the Lord. That means, oh, I've got to do something. What am I going to do? All right, saints, how are you going to be strong in the Lord? It's a present passive imperative. Dunamis is the power of God. The N in front of it means it's a power that's from within. In the present tense, it's a habitual action. Passive voice means the source is not within yourself. It's coming out from God. It's empowerment from within. In union, it's in the sphere of the Lord. In the union with the Lord and in the strength of His might. In that which represents His royal dominion. Put on the full armor of God. The panoply of God that you may be able to stand firm against the methodes, the carefully thought out, linear, crafted schemes, plans of the devil. He's a thinker. We know that from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the noema, the thoughts of Satan. He has plans, and his plan is that that which represents these saints that are supposed to displace me, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, know you not, you shall judge the world, know you not, you shall judge angels. It's not going to happen on my watch. I will stop this. This purpose will not be realized. And that which represents the church coming to measure the stature of fullness of Christ, being filled into all the fullness of God so that we qualify to displace him, it's not going to happen. It's a life and death battle with Hasatan. And he is dead set on opposing anything that represents the realization, what we see objectively in Ephesians 1-3, through subjectively and experientially, chapter 4, verses 1-6, through chapter 6, verse 9. It had an immediate view then, but here it is. We're looking at it in these last and final days. God is saying to us, habitually allow yourself to be strengthened in union with the Lord and in the strength of his might, that which establishes his dominion. Put all the full armor of God that you may be able, have the strength, the power to stand firm, hold your ground and not retreat against the schemes of the devil. Notice, put on the armor of God. The genitive there means it's his armor. We don't have it. We don't have any armor. Who is the armor? Romans chapter 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. These are attributes of the perfected character of Jesus Christ. Armor means as you walk out the purpose of God and you're facing conflict and spiritual warfare issues, appropriate, appropriate the victorious life and nature and character of Jesus Christ that's already won the battle for you. The battle is already won by him, and so that strength and that constitution which he imparts as a high priest to us, and mediates to us, the Holy Spirit, that nature becomes our nature. We're to become a partaker of the divine nature, as we see in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, which culminates in the morning star. For our struggle, our palais, our hand-to-hand combat, this face-to-face, this is not something esoteric. 
we're engaged right here in all of our ways of walk. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, 9. He's there. He's in the atmosphere. Ephesians 2, 1. He's the prince of the power of the air. Take up the full armor of God. Stand firm. Hold your ground. Therefore, having girded your loins with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Notice, having girded the loins with the truth. Now, where does that take you to? He's citing Isaiah eleven fifteen. Jesus already did that for us. He is the truth. He walked out the truth. He embodied the truth of God in his humanity as he walked out in faith and obedience and was filled with the fullness of the Father before he was crucified. That nature of Jesus Christ is the truth, that's to be the first domain that all the armor attaches. So what are loins? That's the reproductive area. That's the place of strength in the natural realm, the koilia. Strength. Where would that strength be? In Ephesians chapter 4, we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. So this strength, that anchor point, is the renewal of the spirit of our mind. Our minds need to be renewed, but when it's renewed in the spirit of the mind, then that brings us into a place of Ephesian ascendancy. The spirit is not just something in our head, it's in our spirit, so that the very strength of who we are, Christ is the source of that strength, so that he is reproduced and expressed as the very center and anchor point for all the other attributes that represent the armor of God. Girded your loins for truth. That's action. That means when we're in the Word, Lord, I not only want to have my mind renewed, I want my spirit to connect with your spirit. I want the loins, that which represents the capacity to reproduce who you are in evangelism and ministering to others, that your life is released in the very spirit having girded your loins with truth. So we are in the word, we're being renewed, and then having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This breastplate of righteousness, if you put it on, this righteousness is not a born-again righteousness. That's the foundation, because when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he pronounces and declares us righteous, Romans 3, 19 and following, and other places. If you put on the breastplate of righteousness, that means we are doing something in the walk that precedes that is righteous. And if the Lord is pointing out something in our life relationally or with others or with Him that is unrighteous, we repent and we get right with Him so that we're actually putting on experientially righteousness. And dikaiosune, according to Abbot Smith, Greek lexicon, is conformity to the revealed will of God in thought, word, and deed. I say it again. Conformity to the revealed will of God in thought, word, and deed. That's the definition for dikaiosune, righteousness. You do it. You put it on. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does that do? That protects the heart. So when Satan comes like a flood, you say, well, you can say whatever you want about me, even if it's all true. It doesn't matter. My conduct, you cannot charge me with anything because I know I'm walking uprightly with the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. I will not be subject to your oppression and your lies about me or about how you're lying to me about somebody else. Breastplate of righteousness, that protects our inner man. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, preparation is okay, it is the equipping, the gospel of peace, people interpret that preaching the gospel in your walk, and I think that's an application, but remember we're called to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. So if you're standing firm, you need to have a firm footing. If your feet, that is that which is the ground in which you're standing firm against the wilds of the enemy, with the preparation of the gospel of peace, then that means these studded sandals, when you're being hit and pushed against, you have a firm footing. And it's the gospel of peace. I'm reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. I have peace with God based upon the fact that I am reconciled to Him. And no matter what He says, and no matter what the charges are, He can't make me move because I'm reconciled to God. That is peace with God. Firm footing. You have a solid standing in grace, as we see in Romans 5, 1 and 2. And then it goes on to say, in addition to all, taking up the broad shield of faith with which you will be able to have this divinely imparted strength to extinguish or quench all the flaming missiles of the evil one. The shield of faith. Faith is a verbal noun, which means we actively appropriate who Jesus Christ is as the author and finish of our faith. It is that which is the whole body of New Testament truth, the faith once and for all delivered of the saints, Jude 3, 
And as we are occupied with that revelation and truth, it becomes a shield of faith. And so as we are living by faith in that which is the revealed will of God, it is the person of Jesus Christ and all that he claims to be in the word and says that he is, then we have this broad shield of faith. It covers the entire body. And this broad shield of faith, when they're put in rows, it becomes a phalanx. It's a broad shield of faith with which shield of faith you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. How do those missiles come? They come in at least two phases. There may be more, but there are at least two. First of all, he creates an atmosphere of emotions. Like we experienced last week before the mandate came down for us to be isolated, quarantine. There was fear. I mean, it was supernaturally charged. And it's in the atmosphere. It's a satanic thing. And you see it all over people's face. There is fear. So that's a flaming missile. It's seeking to attach to us as believers. And so with that atmosphere of fear, then the second salvo is thoughts, 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 thoughts. Has God really said? Has he really said? Has he really said this? Second Corinthians chapter 10, we need to bring every thought into captivity for the obedience of Christ. For the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but are mighty before God. We stand on the word of God so when the emotions are there, so they seem to validate the messaging that comes in from Satan to discourage and to create darkness, and that it's all real. Remember, these flaming missiles are real, but they're not the truth. The emotions are not the truth, and that becomes a framework for the actual messaging to come in because your emotions are now lined up with that which conforms to the satanic lie and the messaging that contradicts the Word of God. You will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So two things there. The helmet of salvation. You read commentators. The word salvation to them is basically, it's when you got born again. And Paul is not talking about born-again salvation, although that's the inception. He's talking about eschatological salvation. I want to really emphasize this because on the website we have Helmet of Salvation. You can go through that on the video section. It's called the Helmet of Salvation. But just a couple things so that you understand the significance of this. Because this armor that we're putting on is that which Jesus wears when he returns. Because Paul's imagery, he's drawing from Isaiah 59. When Jesus comes back, he comes back in the armor of a church completed. And it's awesome. And all through the centuries, individual people, as they come to full reward, hundredfold, it's all accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. So when Jesus returns with his whole church, the entire history of experience or righteousness and that armor is now in place for Jesus legally to come back from the third heaven through the second heavens. And so that becomes under his feet and he meets us in the first heavens, Satan's headquarters. He's the prince of the air. And we're caught up to meeting there. But he comes back legally to displace Satan. And that armor is the legal criteria by which the enemy is displaced. That's all covered in the Celestial Court series, that particular concept. In this particular passage, the Helmet of Salvation, I want to read from Romans 13. And it's very clear that Paul's understanding of salvation is not just an initial thing, it's comprehensive. It's salvation in the past, salvation in the present, salvation in the future. Redemption of the body, final salvation. So here, this helmet is looking at final salvation. Final salvation is that which needs to be fully in place as the former of God as we come into proximity of the rapture because all hell is going to break loose against the church. We haven't seen nothing yet. Nothing. It's coming. And God's going to allow the enemy out. He's going to let him out on a long leash, saints. Brace yourself. So are you afraid when you hear that? Then you choose the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1, the beginning of wisdom, and Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. It's a choice. Romans 13, verse 11. And doing this, loving, loving with supernatural love, which is the fulfillment of the law, this do, knowing the time. Knowing the time. The kairos, the strategic crisis and opportunity which we are now living 
is what he was saying then and absolutely now, like never before in history. Knowing the time. Saints, do we know the time? That it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. That's the whole characteristic feature of the Church of Laodicea. I'm rich and I have need of nothing. You do not know. That means you're asleep. Waken from sleep, saints. This slumber where you don't even know where you are in history. Well, I hope the Lord's coming back in my generation. What do you mean you hope? Why don't you know? Where have you been? Knowing the time. For now, final salvation is nearer than when we first believed. That's initial salvation when we first believed. We're talking about a salvation that's now nearer, still future, than when you believe, which is initial salvation. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. That is the coming of the Lord for his people. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of that which is a manifestation of the divine nature. Light is the nature of God emanating from us who we are characterologically. Put on the whole armor of God. Let us behave properly in terms of our walk. Let us walk properly as in the day as we're living in the light of eternity, not carousing. This is partying. This is all the licentious orgy type of activity, carousing and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the armor of light, verse 12, which is the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, I am the light of the world. He who goes on following me will not walk in darkness, will have the light that manifests the life. It's a light that originates from the life. What an amazing statement. You know, John 8 verse 12. There's the armor of light and that is a person put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Jesus says the person that means if we put him on who do people meet and they see? That means you're not there anymore. You're crucified with Christ. It's no longer you living us but Christ lives in me. Put on the armor of life. And then 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to come back and wrap this up. In 1 Thessalonians, which is the promise of the rapture for the church, and we will probably be visiting that at some time in the future as things get darker, we'll see. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he addresses those who have died in the Lord. And he mentions that we're not of the darkness, the day of the Lord. We're not going to be a part of the day of the Lord. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. Because when they're saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them. By the way, the world is not going to be saying peace and safety until after the rapture. As long as we're here functioning as salt and light, there is not going to be peace. Chaos, things leading up to World War III. Whenever we're removed, they can say, ah, now peace and safety, you see. Then sudden destruction will come upon them. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you. What day is that? The day of the Lord. It's not going to overtake you because, church, you're not going to be in the day of the Lord. Anyone that says the church is going through the great tribulation is deceived after the same manner that Satan deceived Eve, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. There's deception there. The church will not be in the day of the Lord. Period. According to the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. You're not in darkness that that day, verse 4, should overtake you like a thief. We're not to be asleep, etc., as the world is asleep. Verse 8, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith. Ephesians is righteousness. Breastplate of faith. I walk by faith and not by sight. And love. There's how we relate to one another, relate to God in sacrificial love. We see each other through the eyes and heart of Jesus. And as a helmet... The joyous expectation of getting saved, you're already saved, of eschatological salvation. Final salvation, there's your helmet of salvation. Right there. It's not about going to a commentary. The Bible is its own commentary. The hope of salvation, help us. Soteria, the hope and joyous and confident expectation of final deliverance. For God has not destined us for wrath, that is to be in the day of the Lord, chapter 5, verse 2. He's not appointed us to wrath, but to what? To obtain final salvation. This is your inheritance. It's an obtainment. It's an acquisition. In other words, those who are alive and survive, it means you are a part of that surviving remnant. It's acquisition. You can't acquire initial salvation. But to be in a place where we are constitutionally 
when the Lord returns for the church, it's final salvation. For the peripoesis, the obtaining to take acquisition through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together, present tense with him, fellowship with him. Therefore, encourage one another, build up one another, just as you are doing. Second Thessalonians 2, the same thing. They were saying that because of pressures, they're false teachers, some prophetic revelations saying that they were in the day of the Lord. It had come, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. And he said, let no one deceive you. As the serpent deceived Eve in the garden, ex apatow, don't let anybody deceive you. So there's going to be a final eschatological deception coming in on the church regarding pressure and suffering like we see in Second Thessalonians chapter 1. It's going to be interpreted by false teachers that you're in the day of the Lord. So things are going to get very dark before the rapture so that there's going to be an occasion for this prophetic word to be fulfilled. You're going to be told you're in the day of the Lord and you're not. It won't be in the day of the Lord. Whatever conditions there will be, the false teachers and those that are teaching this, there's going to be occasion, 2 Thessalonians 1, pressure, persecution will be in place so that the conditions will be interpreted as that. He goes on to say, that day will not come the day of the Lord unless the Antichrist is revealed in his temple. And he can't be revealed, verse 6 and 7, until the restrainer is removed. The restrainer is the third person of the Trinity operating in the body and bride of Christ as the restraint. And he was restraining through the church. Once the restrainer is removed, when the church is removed, and then Satan himself and the person of the Antichrist will be revealed. He'll have his parousia. In view of that, he goes and describes that event in chapter 2, verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you, literally, if you have your margin there, from the beginning, it's actually, op arches, first fruits. Christ is the first fruits of resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. You share in that. He's first fruit. You're first fruit with him. Then there are those who are his that is coming. And then at the end, he will deliver up the kingdom of the Father. So there are four toxis, that is, orders of the first resurrection. We share in Jesus Christ as the first fruit of resurrection. This is a rapture statement. This is final salvation. He's chosen us as first fruits for final salvation. Final deliverance. Things are going to be dark. 2 Thessalonians 1. It was very dark for them. It was being misinterpreted. It said it's in the day of the Lord, chapter 2, verse 2. No, it's not the day of the Lord. It is that which leads up to and preparatory for the revelation of Antichrist. He shows you from the beginning for salvation. How? Through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And it was for this that he called you through our gospel that you may, there's the word again, gain as a possession, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians, gain final salvation, gain the glory of Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm, hold to the tradition, the apostolic revelation that you received from the apostles, and he's talking about himself here. Hold to the tradition, that apostolic transmission, which you were taught, whether by word, by mouth, or by letter from us. So that's quite amazing. There's more. So we'll go back to Ephesians put on and take the helmet of salvation, that final salvation that is going to be needed in your mindset as the days darken and the adversary comes in like a flood. He's going to come in like a flood. We experienced some of that last week prior to the mandate on the lockdown of New York. The atmosphere of fear was everywhere. It was supernaturally charged. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, this is a real important one, saints. Take uh, the sword of the Spirit. Somebody say this is the only offensive weapon in the panoply or the full armor of God. It's actually both. It's not only an offensive weapon, but it's the best defensive weapon. Why? Well, take up the sword of the Spirit. In other words, you're not wielding it. It's the Spirit wields it. It's the Spirit's sword. So where do we come in? Take up the sword of the Spirit. Well, that's what it said. It's the sword of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who actuates the sword. But how is it activated? Which is the rhema of God. Not the logos. That's the inherent characteristic of the Word of God. It's the Word spoken. It's the same word used in the Gospels when Jesus is tempted by the devil. He said, if you be the Son of God, change these stones into bread 
And Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the rhema of God, the spoken word. He just quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8. And with the spoken word, Jesus, he didn't wield any spirit. He spoke the word and the spirit took that up and used it against Hasatan. He says, if you be the son of God, man shall not live by bread alone. I'm here, though son of God I am, I'm here to be man. And so he took the rhema of God. And notice that when we speak the word of God, in the temptation. We quote the scripture. We say, it is written. It is written. Just like Jesus in the temptation. Whatever comes upon us, we have the word. But emotions are telling me this. And the fiery darts are saying this. It is written. It is written. I'm not perfected in that yet. I mean, I can get hit with things. Either it's coming towards me, or it's coming towards me, towards one of you or somebody else. But it is written. Then we pray and we intercede. When something comes in, there's an attack upon us or someone else. We step in and we intercede. It is written. It is written. It is written. I will not succumb or be a part of this satanic lie. The sword of the Spirit is only the sword when the Word of God is verbally spoken. That's when the Holy Spirit is activated to take what the Word of God is coming out of our mouth like Jesus in the temptation and deals with the adversary. And I love doing that when I'm counseling. I'm stuck on something, so I'll just start reading scripture. Well, this person's here. They got all this stuff going on in their head, and they want to talk by. I said, you be quiet. I'm reading the Word of God. I don't care what altar it is. It doesn't mean you listen to the Word of God. You need to listen. No, I don't need to listen. You need to listen. I just start reading, and then the things start happening, and they come on. They maybe switch into something else, get in a deeper core. Why? Because the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the division between soul and the spirit is a critic, a sifter, an analyzer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, Hebrews 4.12. The sword of the spirit, which is the rhema, the verbal utterance of God. And that's why Apostle says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all understanding. And then you notice, and then overall, all this putting on these aspects of Jesus, these characteristic features of Jesus, overall, prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. There's a spirit governed life with this in view to be on the alert on the alert with perseverance and petition for all the saints. How much we need to do that today to pray for the body of Christ in this particular circumstance we're in. So what's the background? What is Paul quoting in Ephesians 6 when he says put on the whole armor of God? We're going to close with this. Isaiah 59 put on the whole armor of God. Isaiah 59. You see the background, the absolute horrific apostasy, the violence. You read Isaiah 59. Just read it through. The condition of God's covenant people is just filled with all forms of iniquity and idolatry. There's social injustice. The nation is imploding because of corruption. Justice is turned back, verse 14. Righteousness stands far away. Truth is stumbled in the street, and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. So it's really culturally bad. It's very, very dark. Yes, truth is lacking. Now the Lord saw, verse 15, and it was displeasing in his sight. It was evil, that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man. Well, Ephesians 2.15, the church is the one new man. And when that one new man is completed and attains the major stature of the fullness of Christ, Jesus will have his armor. There is no man. So the prophet didn't know that this is not only a personal Christ, but this is a Christ coming back in full armor. And that full armor was built and came into place from Pentecost to the rapture. So there's a church that is now embodying the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And the walk of the church throughout the ages in various measures and degrees has given God what he needs and requires to come back and to display Satan and to take him down so that he's removed from the heavens and thrust down to the earth as we see in Revelation chapter 12. He saw there was no man and he was astonished there was no one to intercede. No one to stand in the gap and represent God in the midst of this apostasy and darkness that was in the nation at the time. Then his own arm brought salvation to him. What kind of salvation is this? Salvation brought salvation. Salvation to a remnant. Isaiah 4, there's a remnant. 
Isaiah chapter 10 verses 20 through 23, a remnant that is ready and prepared to be delivered. He brought salvation to him. There's a remnant waiting. And at the second advent, Israel, there'll be a remnant waiting to be saved. His own arm, that arm that saved a nation in the Exodus, and his righteousness upheld him. All that Jesus attained in his obedience as man on earth, he's the perfection of righteousness, and now that upheld him. He's coming back in righteousness, and he put on righteousness like a breastplate. Well, that's what Paul disclosed. That's what he's doing now in the church age. He is putting on. He is helping us through the Holy Spirit put on what he has won and gained for us when he walked this earth as son of man. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate. And the helmet of salvation on his head. Final deliverance. In this context, all Isaiah sees is final deliverance from God's covenant people of Israel. He's looking forward to delivering that remnant that will repent and he will come back. And a helmet of salvation, that's all Isaiah saw. But now Paul takes that, extrapolates that, and says, well, this is now corporate. Isaiah didn't see that. Paul took this very description here in Isaiah 59 and said, well, this has a corporate name. There's a corporate Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 12. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. Know you not that you shall judge the world? Know you not you shall judge angels, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3? He wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle zeal, jealous for God. I'm going to settle a score. I'm going to shake everything and be shaken, beginning with the church and then the nations, in order that that which cannot be shaken might remain. According to their deeds, so he will repay. Payday is coming, and this generation, remember, judgment begins the household of God. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense, reward to their enemies are getting what they deserve. To the coastlands, he will make recompense. Not only is this deal with Israel, but I'm going to reach out to touch all the nations. Isaiah 24, 34. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, like a mighty pent up stream. The waters narrow down and the blast is strong. Which the wind, that is the spirit of the Lord, drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, that means you're a part of the remnant, declares the Lord. So this is second advent. And how could Paul take that which pertains to the second coming of Jesus Christ and say that we're to put on that armor that Messiah is going to come back to defeat his enemies in second advent? Because he can't come back in the second advent in this armor until he's finished with the church. We have that characterological righteousness, truth, all that which pertains to his character as that is being formed in the individual lives and we're walking out that which is the character and nature of Jesus Christ and faith and obedience. This is an accumulative thing and God is keeping score of all this and this armor must be in place before the rapture so that when Jesus does return, he comes back in the person of his church, his bride. Remember Revelation 19? He comes back and who's with him? His bride. And he comes back on a white horse. That's a Roman victory steed. That's a trampled procession. And his overcomers, they come back on white horses, right? They're not looking at his face. Every eye will see him. No, that's second advent. We're looking at his back. We're actually in him. And he is in full armor. And that full armor is the armies of heaven. And he will slay with the breath of his mouth the Antichrist. So God's up to big stuff, big things. We don't know where this is going to go in terms of our culture, but if this lockdown remains for even two weeks, years, it's going to be very, very narrow and tight navigating. God has foreseen these times, and this is an opportunity for the church to really become the church, and for the church to be the true salt and light. So this armor that we're putting on is there. It's being evidenced. And when we're talking to someone about Jesus, we're not cowards. We just say, do you have the hope? Do you have hope that where we are this time in history, that there's a way out? God has an escape clause. Because if you don't take that escape clause, there's a time coming on the earth that it'll be the worst time in history that has ever existed. It'll be worse than any time in history. Jesus prophesied that. Did you know that? Did you know that there's a time coming that it is so horrific that if God didn't shorten those days, that no one would be saved? 
Would you like to know the escape clause? Let me show you from the Bible. Give them the bad news, dead in trespasses and sins. They already know, people know they're sinners. And this is what Jesus did. And he can become your only hope and saved, pronounced and declared righteous, forgiven, and a place in heaven. In this generation, at some point, we know the time, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first and we are alive and are the surviving remnant shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be. Comfort one another of these words. Caught up together at the same time. Almost at the same time. It's coming. We're in the final corridor. Denema. The final part of a play. A movie, a narrative in which the strands of the plot are drawn together and matters are explained or resolved. The final resolution of the intricacies of a plot as of a drama or novel. The place in the plot at which this occurs. The outcome or resolution of doubtful series of occurrences. Synonyms, finale, final scene, final act, last act, epilogue, end, ending, finish, close, Culmination, climax, conclusion, resolution, solution, clarification, unraveling, winding everything up. So we're in that time, saints. Father, we commit all this to you and you would vivify us, you would impart to us that which we don't have in ourselves, but the life of the ages who indwells us in the person of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.